I've got to ask this of my next guest, uh, Congressman Thomas Massey, who is in one of my favorite. I've never even been there, but it's like my favorite spot. He calls it the Shire. And as I always say, everything can be led back to Lord of the Rings. And Congressman Thomas Massey joins us from his Shire. And is it really look like that still? Because that looks pretty much exactly. Is that a still behind you? Are you just in front of like a photo? It's three. I'm three miles from here because my Internet doesn't work where I where that picture is from, <laughs> which is my living room. I'm like that. But, it looks as just as picturesque as the last time you were on with us. It, what gives? But every time I wake up, it looks like this as the fog is clearing. And this is the Shire. You can see Mordor in the background. <laughs> I'm not wearing precious. I call my congressional pr pin the precious. The precious. Uh, I my love precious. it. I love it. Well, uh, it, it's gorgeous. And I love I love the background. Congressman Massey, always good to have you. Uh, I, I have to get your your reaction to the big news yesterday. I really wasn't surprised that he selected uh, Kamala or Kamala Harris. I was surprised the Democrats thought that that was the least problematic choice that they could have gone with, but wasn't surprised that it was her. What is your, what is your reaction to this? Especially now that all these pe we have people in the streets have been in the streets for like the past two months protesting against a number of things, but what they say began as bad policing, but yet they're going to put support the number one bad cop in California on the ticket as VP. What gives? She wants to lock you up and throw you away for marijuana possession. I mean, I don't know how that's going to appeal to the Bernie side of their campaign, but they have to appeal to them somehow because and she might because she wants to do away with all private health care and put everybody on Medicare. Oh, but gosh. what struck me when I was listening to that clip you just played of Joe Biden was that only just a year ago he could actually form sentences and now he can't. I mean, the decline between that debate and now is very striking. Mm. So I, you know, and I think it might we just, be one of the reasons why they have a heavy, because I think that Kamala yeah. Harris is going to be his attack dog, so to speak, uh, his heavy, his, his, his heavy hitter that goes out there. Let me ask you this. I like vice president Mike Pence. I think he's incredibly polite. He's, he is very statesman. Does this political environment lend to that? Uh, or is he going to have to change his approach because they're going to have debates and he's going to have to really go at, he's going to have to be the surrogate for the president and against uh, Joe Biden's VP because they're going to try to invite Trump to every single argument that Kamala Harris wants to have. That would be the worst thing for the campaign to do. How does Pence fare in this, though? Well, you know, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. But if I were going to have a battle plan... It would be for Pence to be the calm statesman in this race because, uh, you know, you've got a, a radical in Kamala Harris. You've got uh, Joe Biden, who's losing it. You've got President Trump, who's over the top a lot of times. And I think people want to come home to, you know, in the election to the calm person in this race in these in these crazy times. So I think Pence will will attract people if he just mm. is who he is, which is a gentleman. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. It, always make your, your opposition look crazier than you might be, feel, or seem sometimes, uh, for sure. That's not necessarily my strategy in Congress. Some days I it was look Churchill's. Like I mean, a church, I mean, he liked it, so it's good. I mean, it's good enough for all of us. I have so many things I want to ask you about, including uh, this documentary that is on HBO called The Swamp. You're featured in it. It's uh, done by the same team that did Get Me Roger Stone, and it looks at corruption in government and i have to say like some of the shots of the law i mean some of y'all when you're talking to the to the camp to the person interviewing you for the documentary it does seem very i don't know it, it seems very um like you're, you're like you're i'm going to come and tell you about how corrupt this government is and while you have like the washington monument and everything behind you and i know there was one particular spot where matt gates was talking and they have uh the capital behind him. it just seemed very uh, James Bondish, in a way, talk to me about this documentary and and your involvement in it. Well, we gave them unprecedented access. I mean, we let them in our offices. They came here to my farm, to the Shire. I I let them pass the gate. Wow. And I was very apprehensive about this because ultimately it was edited in Hollywood. I mean, yeah. they took the 
the video to Los Angeles and edit it. And we had no control over what came out. And obviously, if it's edited in Hollywood, it's going to have a, a left leaning bent to the narrative. But when they interview Matt Gates and Ken Buck and I, they really gave us a fair shake. I don't feel like they took our words out of context. I felt like they um, understood the message we were trying to get out and they helped us to amplify it, which is things are really broken in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. People don't understand how we have to rent our committee assignments. Literally, the Democratic Party expects Democrats to give them money for the committee seats they're on. And the better what? the committee you get, the more money you're supposed to haul in and give it to your party. So the NRCC does the same thing. It's a D triple C. That's why we're sneaking around. We are literally, you can see our colleagues in the background yeah. walking around doing this stuff. <laughs> I did not know that that's actually a really good way to put it, that it's kind of like you're renting the seat. You're, you're sort of like yeah. leasing it out and it depended upon how much money you can bring in with fundraising. That, that's right. It's a fundraising tocracy. It's not a meritocracy. <laughs> Everything is so much in Washington is broken. What does this documentary do differently? Because I think we all, I don't know, I've never really had, and I mean, I say this with no offense, I like you, uh, no, but I, I don't really like Washington. I mean, it's, you know, pretty architecture yeah. in that it's crazy. People there are crazy. Everybody's crazy. It's, you know, high stress. You have what you're talking about happening in the Capitol. We know it's corrupt. We know dirty dealings are happening all the time. I mean, we watched uh, uh, our last election. Uh, I mean, that was kind of like a silent coup d'etat in a way where you had operatives trying to undermine a free and fair election. So what does this do differently or bring to the table that we are not familiar with and we may not know? Well, first of all, they humanized us. You know, they. You mean the wait, they didn't say these monster Republicans, Thomas Massey no. and Matt? Oh, wow, that's different. Yeah. So yeah, so instead of making us out to be terrible, they showed we have a human side. They showed the people that vote for us. They uh, showed our staff, us working with our staff, instead of just talking heads. You know, mm -hmm. and so I think they really did do a, a 360 degree view of who we are and what we're trying to fight for. Uh, so that's different than the typical thing you see. Um, it's not just red versus blue either. They showed, um, like for instance, we're trying to end the war in Afghanistan, try to stop another war from starting. And so Ken Buck, Matt Gates, and I were working across the aisle and they show how sometimes you can work across the aisle to get things done. But that when you try to do that, it's actually your leadership that conspires, like the Republican leadership will conspire with the Democratic leadership to keep um, these grassroots efforts down. So, I mean, we saw that with Tea um, Party. I had to have a few drinks when I watched it the first time. <laughs> and because, first of all, it was very stressful. I didn't know what they were going to make us out to be. But also, um, it's a little bit depressing. But in the end, there, uh, you know, I think they have a quote for me that says, ultimately, the people are still in charge. Ultimately, the people still vote for the people that come up here and do these things. So the voters need to get smarter if they want to change Washington, D.C. That's sort of the message. There are no simple answers. And I see so many things in play here when you look when you kind of step back and you look at everything from the lockdown to the and the the effect it's had on the economy, school reopening, the pandemic, uh, it, even apart from the the 2020 and, and interparty fights, uh, a lot of things in play to determine uh, the 2020 election. And one of the biggest, uh, I think, things that we have to worry about are our enthusiasm of our voters. What does that look like right now? What are you seeing? And, and what would you tell uh, uh, Republicans are, are facing a tough road in navigating these issues and, and uh, appealing to the undecideds and independent voters with messaging that is statesmen, but also you got to be tough. You got to be tough, yeah. you can be civil, and you can be firm, and you can be hard because what's happening is nonsense. Voters are tired of it. But there are still some that they find comfort in the old way of things. Maybe they've always been Democrats. Maybe they've always voted Democrats, similar to like 2016. What do Republicans need to do to make this a success? Well, first of all, President Trump is still popular within the Republican base in Kentucky. I polled it twice this spring. He is, his favorability is 94% once, and it was 93% the other time. Even Senator McConnell has a high favorability in Kentucky because of his Supreme Court work, yeah. work on getting those Supreme Court nominees. 
So I think our base is fairly energized. Uh, I think Joe Biden is going to depress their base. I think uh, people are looking for stability. You know, these these are unstable times with the virus and the schools being closed. And, and now the Democrats are egging on sort of the the violent protests, not peaceful protests, but violent protests. And I'm always careful to differentiate that because I think you have a right to peacefully protest. Not to but you riot, don't have a right to bust glass right. and storm and take things and hurt people. So I think um, independence, that's really in every election who you're after in November. The people who are on the fence, the moderate Democrats, the moderate Republicans and the independents, and I think they will come home to a message of, of stabil stability. We don't need anarchy. Mm. One last quick question for you before we go and talking with uh, Congressman Thomas Massey, beautiful state of Kentucky. That's his shire right there and behind him. <laughs> To speak of enthusiasm with Republican voters, one thing that would make a lot of voters enthused is to see Republicans in the Senate and Republicans elsewhere hold accountable the individuals who were responsible for all of the drama after 2016, Mueller, et cetera. Why hasn't that been done and which Republicans are holding that up? Oh, well, a, a lot of these things, like when we uncovered them in the oversight committee, they get referred to the judicial system and it's the, the courts in Washington, D.C., which are still stacked with liberal judges. So it's hard to even get them to act on anything once you put it into the judicial system. Uh, we, you know, we, when Obama was president and it was his cabinet, uh, Eric Holder and those folks who were just thumbing their nose at us, we thought we wished we had a jail in, in the Capitol. You know, there was some talk at the State of the Union. Could we nab him with the Capitol Hill police and put him in jail? Because they were just thumbing their nose at us. And the only recourse we had was the court system. And it's the D.C. You know, circuit. Mm. So um, that's where a lot of it bogs down. I want I want to pass legislation that has teeth in it. For instance, Dana, one piece of legislation I would love to see is not just uh, penalties, but criminal penalties for anybody in government that spies on a, a legislator or a campaign without the knowledge of the legislator or the campaign. Because when they can spy on us in the legislative branch, which they do, or when they can spy on their own president, even though ostensibly they're in the executive branch, then they have a lot of power. And we need to take that power away from the political class that are in Washington, DC, regardless of who gets elected, there's the same people. Let's put criminal penalties uh, against the government officials. Let's make it a felony to do some of this stuff and to put some real punishments behind them. We could do that legislatively. Yeah, there needs to be some kind of accountability for some of these folks, for sure. Congressman Thomas Massey, we're going to watch you in the swamp. We're going to watch you. All right. I hope everyone Thanks, checks Dana. that out uh, on Netflix <laughs> as well. Uh, Congressman, always good to see you. God bless. We'll talk with you again soon. Appreciate you. God bless, Dana. You too. God bless. Take care.